Well, that's intentional. They didn't want uh, minorities to get the impression that that was a way of dealing with some of the problems. And that's the way countries all over the world deal with problems. But they didn't want us to get the idea. They wanted us also to feel inferior, less than men, because they know that men will stand up and fight, that men will fight for their rights and for their families and for their homes in defense of their homes. But we were supposed to be less than men. The next thing is that what is not commonly known is that the deacons of self-defense from uh, Monroe, Louisiana, and uh, also that the all of the radical groups, even uh, SNCC, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, the Panthers, they all got their inspiration from Monroe. It, that's documented in my FBI files. But uh, nobody wanted to say this. They didn't want to give us credit for this type of thing. The next thing is that you have the situation of other groups that's resorted to some form of violence, lost people. It's like a situation in Chicago where they broke into the house with the Panthers sleeping and they just wiped out a number of them. But we never lost anybody. That some of our people shot other people and a policeman claimed he was shot but we didn't lose not a single person. So this was our Mount Vernon. Now what do I mean by Mount Vernon? As a child, we learned in school that George Washington led a ragtag army against the greatest army in the world, the British Army, an empire that the sun never set on its flag. So he led this ragtag army, he overcame the oppression of the British throne, he became president of the United States. Then he went home to Mount Vernon and lived out the rest of his life as a peaceful country farmer gentleman. That was the Mount Vernon that they teach in school, especially to white children, that you might resist tyranny and you might still survive. But for us, we had no Mount Vernon. They wanted to show us, if you resist, white tyranny, white oppression, you will die like other people. Can you imagine an eight-year-old child traveling with his mother? And he says, Mother, that street, oh, is uh, that school is uh, Malcolm X, or that's the Harry T. Moore, or that's the Martin Luther King High School. Uh, mother, what happened to them? What happened to Reverend King, this great man of peace who loved his people? And she got to tell him, son, he was murdered. Was, mother, why was he murdered? He was murdered because he loved justice. He wanted justice for his people. Well, a Malcolm X, what happened, mother? Same thing. Harry T. Moore, he was murdered because he wanted justice for his people. And there's a long list of that. Now, can you imagine a child, a young boy, when you tell him that? What is it? What is the psychological impact in his head? Oh, if I follow that course, I must be ready for suicide. And that course is death. There's no Mount Vernon for me. And so this is why our Mount Vernon, they don't want the people to know about it. And uh, so this is why a man uh, like the President of the United States who would be against civil rights, would also sign for a Martin Luther King holiday. I think a Martin Luther King holiday is all right, and I'm for it. But I don't jump up and shout because we've got it, because I know the meaning behind it. The meaning is that once a year, every black child in America is reminded that they shot this great man down like a dog on the streets of Memphis. Shot him down like a dog. What did they shoot him for? because he was seeking justice for his people. You see, when you, and just like Charles, uh, Mega Evers, same thing. Now, that's not going to encourage a child, a young boy, to stand up. He doesn't want to be like somebody who was slaughtered like a dog. But if you can say, oh, Mount Vernon. You know, George Washington went to Mount Vernon and lived out his day. Well, that's that's a chance. 
Just like when, uh, they, if they should come in here to draft us now for the armed services, we go hoping that we'd be back. But if the man came and say, look, you go kiss, kiss your wife and your neighbors and everybody goodbye, all of it. Go kiss your loved ones because you won't be coming back. Do you think you'd be drafted into the armed services? No. No, you would never stand for that. In fact, we'd kill him before he got out of here. So that's not the type of thing that's really conducive to resistance on our part. But as a result, I was able to overcome that by analyzing these situations and observing what they were doing. And the Marine Corps, even though they put me out, I learned more from them than any place else. Because the way they operated, the way they dealt in fear, all kinds of things. So when I got control of the NACP, the organizer, I appointed these veterans. I knew that veterans had been trained to do things if they had the leadership. But the only thing was missing was the leadership. So we got 200 people under arms, and these men fought the Klan. And they didn't show a bit of fear, not a bit. And sometimes I found out how deep this feeling is running with some young people. Sometimes at night, the guys would sit around and they would say, Brother Rob, do you think they're coming tonight? And I would say, no. And they would say, why aren't they coming? I said, because we're here. That's why they're not coming. Because we had dug foxholes, we had steel helmets, we introduced the first Molotov cocktail to the freedom movement. And they had all kind of military equipment, sandbags we had put up. And uh, I would say, well, the reason they're not coming... Did they ever come, Mr. Yeah, they did come once, what but they didn't get in. Oh, well, there was a shootout. And they left they're running from the black community. The problem was that uh, 18 black women had been struck on the streets with objects from cars that white men were passing throughout these objects. So the black people, ministers had been up and they were begging the officials to stop these people from making these forays into our community. And uh, officials told the black ministers that they had as much right for the Klan to organize as for our communist NAACP. So we asked the preachers, please don't go back anymore. We'll take care of it. So they had struck 18 women. So finally we got our rifle club. I got a charter from the National Rifle Association. I had been in the Marine Corps and I found out that civilians could get charters. We got a charter. We dressed up the occupations that made them think that we were white people. Just like a cook became a, rest a restaurant tour Brick Mason became a construction owner, and we just changed the occupations, and they gave us a charter, and we had the parent charter for that uh, county from uh, National Rifle Association. So that gave us the right also to get some of the arms that we used. So as a result, after we had, uh, after we had arms and had a uh, disciplined group, then uh, out in the county, a white man attempted to rape a black woman who was eight months pregnant. And uh, there was a, her neighbor, who was a white woman, had brought her to the police to help to try to get an indictment against the man who tried to rape her. And the chief of police refused to give a warrant, so we had to get involved with the NAACP. And uh, as a result, then some of the men in the community said, well, Suppose we take care of this, they're not going to do anything. And I explained to them that they couldn't take care of it. They said, well, we could just go by his house and sprinkle them, maybe a few machine gun bullets. And said, no, you can't do that. So we just scare him. No. Then they said, well, we could throw a stick of dynamite on his porch, couldn't we? No. So I said, he'd be taken care of in, in the law. So what they did, there was a young white woman lawyer from New York who volunteered to come and prosecute this man. She came all the way to North Carolina. And when they came up for trial, she never got a chance to say anything on the floor because uh, they had brought this white man's wife and they set her down at his side in the court. And his attorney got up and said, Judge, Your Honor, this man is not guilty of any crime. He was just drinking and having a little fun. Now, you see this lovely creature? God's pure flower, God's greatest gift to man, 
this lovely flower, this lovely white woman, that these people are going to come in here and have you to believe that that man left God's greatest gift to him for this? Talking about the black woman. So that was all. The white woman lawyer volunteer didn't even get a chance to say a word in the court. Then he get a chance to just dismiss. So then all the women in the ca in the courtroom, they had packed the courtroom, and they turned to me and they said, "If it hadn't been for you, that man would have been punished." Now you open the floodgates on us. They feel that they can do anything they want to to us with impunity. Now what are you going to say? And I said, "I'm going to say from this day forward." We will meet violence with violence. We will become our own judges, our own prosecutors, and our own executioners. And that's what we'll do from now on. And so they had to take the man out of the back door of the courthouse. They couldn't bring him through the crowd of black women who had congregated there. And it just happened the man was there from the United Press International, and he heard me say that. And that night they flashed that. He called me back at midnight and he wanted to know, say, you had time to cool off. I've got a statement you made today and before I send it out on the wire, I'd like to know, do you stand behind that statement? I said, yeah, I stand behind that statement. If you call me back six years from now, I'll still stand behind it. And they sent it out all over the country. Next day, just like the world was on fire. And uh, people were calling from everywhere, all kind of things. Roy Wickens got on the telephone. And he was calling me from the New York office of the NAACP, and he says, oh, uh, Williams, you made a statement today, and that's a bad statement. And what we want to do, we want to bring you to New York, and they're going to put you on the network and give you a chance to apologize to white America for what you've said. And I said, well, if white America is going to apologize to me first for what they've done to us, I'll apologize to them. He said, no, you have to apologize because they're associating you with the NAACP. I said, well, when I was having all that problem, you didn't feel that we were inseparable. And he said, no, you got to go. I said, no, no, not unless they apologize. You tell them if they apologize to me. Finally, they told my lawyer, who was Conrad Lynn over in New York, had an office in New York. They called him. He was a volunteer lawyer. And they told Conrad, said, Conrad... Uh, we want you to call Williams and tell him that if he will get up and apologize to white America, we'll make him the biggest Negro leader in the United States. And I asked uh, Conrad, I said, what did you say? What, what do you want to say about that? I said, you tell him. I said, go to hell. And he said, oh, I've already told him that because I knew that's what you were going to say. But that's the way it started to, and then the press started to scream across the country and the media, mass media, that I had even advocated the indiscriminate slaughter of white babies in that cradle. So this all ties in of why you've not heard about Monroe, because there was a conspiracy out there to keep this quiet and to let and not to let people know that it was effective. Now, it was picked up overseas. They picked it up in Cuba. They picked it up in China. They picked it up in Africa. And this is how I got to be known in places like China and Cuba, because this was picked up. And those people didn't believe in turning the other cheek. So to them, at last, they saw the possibility of some manhood developing among the black struggle in the United States. But uh, they have done a lot of things to, to, to keep it quiet and keep it out of the history. And now they're beginning more and more is beginning to creep out. Now they've got what they call the Robert Williams Collection at the University of Michigan. And scholars are beginning to dig into this. And it's going to prove embarrassing to a lot of historians of how they missed so much history in this movement. Would you say anything different today? Would you... What would, would you change anything? No, no. No, I wouldn't change. You see, part of the problem I'm looking at now, we've got all of this ghetto problem and violence and uh, drugs. Now, we never used drugs. We thought that's what show people used, the musicians. We felt high on just resisting, 
of standing for what was right. And that gave us our high, and we felt great about that. And uh, the situation of violence. They brought all kinds of money into the South. New station wagons, buildings, to establish nonviolent workshops to convert black people to nonviolence. But today we've got more violence than we've ever had, and I don't know of any workshop, nonviolent workshop, because the violence is ingrown. It's being unleashed against ourselves, so nobody cares about that kind of violence. It's only a great moral issue when other races are involved, and it may be on the receiving end. So the problem is we had, in our community, we had some turf problems. The young guys, teenagers from one side of town didn't allow the, the guys, the young teenagers from my side of town. And they had these fights going on all the time. And the problem was I found out they didn't have any direction. And after we got them involved in civil rights, we started picketing the swimming pool. Swimming pool had been constructed by the federal government, but they barred blacks from it with federal money. We started that. We started all kinds of demonstrations. And pretty soon these groups came together. And when they got direction, they stopped fighting each other and they turned their wrath toward the power structure. And this is why even at this time, they don't want the youth to have any kind of direction that may be positive. And they talk about turning the other cheek and what happened back then. But the youth need to know about the situation now, and they're not about to turn the other cheek, so that we, not, we don't even need to mention that. But this is why these things have been uh, camouflaged, they've been omitted, history has been, they've attempted to rewrite history. But eventually this will come out, and it's nothing like people have been, been taught. In your experience, what made a person, a man or a woman, what made them step out from the crowd and say, I won't take this anymore? What, is it a special kind of individual? What does it take? No, it's primarily leadership. Primary leadership. I remember I was in a church meeting, they had what they called a civic league. And there was a preacher there, we call him an Uncle Tom. And he was always selling out to the money interest. And at that time, that was a dry county, and they were trying to bring in alcohol. And uh, co alcohol companies had paid him to push for a vote. Nobody dared to challenge the man, because he was a strong preacher. And so in this church meeting, he was saying that somebody spread the rumors that I've taken some money from the beer company. And he said, but nobody will get up and tell you that we dare to tell. Well, I hadn't thought anything about it, but then it just struck me because I had been working in the lawyer's office when the company brought the money. And it just struck me then, even though I was alone. And I got up and I said, yes, uh, Reverend Johnson, I was there when they brought the money. Yeah, I'll say that, yeah, you took some money from the bill. And he told me to get out of the church. He said, get out, leave. So he put me out of the church. But as I was walking out one door, I looked on the other side, and there was a young doctor, young Catholic doctor, black guy, and he was coming out too. So he got out and walked when I did, and then two or three other people. Then the next day, the deacons of the church came, and they said, Williams, we want you to tell us the truth. Is that the truth? I said, yeah. They said, that's all we want to know. Next meeting, they said, told the preacher, said, step down. And then more and more people started coming, just started coming like that. But it's a matter that somebody must show some determination and must show some guts. You see, nobody wants to be the first one. Then they're looking to see what will happen to you. And this is why they have always in the South made an example out of the black who will stand up. Because if they make an example out of him, they can keep the status quo. But if he escapes, 
I don't know, it looks bad for them, their way of life. Now, the reason the book that I had put out called Negroes with Guns, we were having a demonstration at a swimming pool, and a crowd, I guess, three or four thousand whites trying to take us. It was just, uh, I was bringing three high school students to a swimming pool. Others were already demonstrating. They wrecked my car on the highway in the intersection, and the police, two policemen standing there, and they looked out and wrecked the car. But they didn't know we were armed. So then the crowd started to close in. They said, kill the niggas, burn the niggas, pour gasoline on the niggas. And they were screaming and hollering. So I got out of the car, and I had an Italian carbine. And I also had carried a, a German Luger and an Army 45. And I told the guys in the back to take it, but not to shoot until they saw me shoot. Don't shoot unless I shoot. If I shoot, you kill as many as you can, because they're going to get us. So they took the gun, but I told the guy to pass me my carbine as I got out of the car. And when he passed me the carbine, I didn't know he had put one in the chamber, so he put one in the chamber when he was passing it to me, so I'd be ready. And I went to put one in there, and this bullet about this long fell out on the ground, and the white people started looking at me, and they're looking at the bullet, and they're looking at the driver, and they stopped. They had come up near the car. Then the policeman ran. He ran down, and he was about 50 feet away. Two policemen, one ran to the front and said, surrender your arm. And I said, this is a mob. We're not surrendering to a mob. If you want my rival, you come by my house. I'll let you have it, but not here. And then the other one ran around to the side of the car and started to pull his gun out of the holster and shoot me in the back. And this young high school boy had this 45 and he put it in his face and his hand was trembling. He said, if you don't put that gun back in your holster, I'll blow your brains out. So the policeman had to put the gun back. He started backing away. He could see death, because that boy would have shot him for sure. And he started backing away, and he fell in the ditch. And when he fell in the ditch, there was an old man, very old white man. I guess he was drinking and drunk. And he started crying. I mean, he was just crying like a baby. And he said, oh, 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 what is this goddamn country coming to? The niggas got guns, and the police can't even arrest them. Now... <clears throat> It took me a long time to understand his feeling. Now I realize why he was crying. Because the gun had been the thing that had always kept them on top and the police power. And he could see that slipping away. And his way of life was going. And this is why he was crying. And this is why I named the book Negro with Guns, because it meant when they got guns the same as everybody else, they'd be treated the same way. And it would be to the advantage of the general public to maintain peaceful relations. So, now that doesn't mean guns for the sake of guns. It doesn't mean violence. But it means a controlled situation, well-disciplined and well-led. But what we've got now is anarchy. A lot of people with guns shooting everybody and all kinds of things and robbing and doing everything else. But that won't pay off. There's no dividend in that. We'll stop right here. Would you like some water? Mr. Williams, what would you say to uh, a, a youngster who uh, was uh, who were to tell you at this point that you know, well, hell, I don't want to get involved. I really don't. You know, I, I want to get my own. I want to be done with it. I want to get my house. I want to get my car, and I want to live my own life. I really don't, you know, the community doesn't care about me. Why should I care about the community? Uh, all I'm going to get is grief. I mean, look at Williams. He, got, he, he did all this stuff and he got nothing for it. What would you say to him? Oh, I got a great deal for it. I've had a good time and I've enjoyed life. One uh, main thing is they ask me, how could you travel around the world? You didn't have a passport. I said I had an FBI wanted poster and that gave me entrance to a lot of places that other people couldn't go. So as a result of that, yeah, well, I really in, enjoy life. I live now in the middle of the Manistee National Forest. I go places freely, and every two, every two or three years, my wife and I are invited to China. We're treated as heads of state. So <clears throat> I don't know how much better I could do. And uh, they kept, they used economic pressure, all kinds of things. But uh, I got to be well-known. I've been given all kinds of opportunities, just like 
they didn't tell the people in the black community, but they invited me to Washington and asked me to help them to normalize relations with China. And uh, they gave me a Ford Foundation grant to the University of Michigan so that they would know about China and I could help them improve relations. So <clears throat> you don't really lose. I would say be honest, be honest with themselves, the others, to be sincere, to vote themselves to truth, and to justice, and most of all, to have some discipline. You gotta have a discipline in life, and never be afraid. But I would also ask them a question. Would, what, how could a fish say that he doesn't want to get involved in the water in the pond? Because the fish is a part of the pond. He's there. If the water's gone, he's gone. And as little as they know it, if this society is gone, they're gone. And this is one thing, too, that <clears throat> I don't understand about white people in this country, especially rich white people. I don't know why they can't have enough understanding to know. If we are destroyed, so will the nation be destroyed. So will they be destroyed. That they can't enjoy what they've got if we're being destroyed, and they don't, I don't know why they can't see that their destiny is tied to ours. Now, it looks like they are some distance, that they've got some insulation, but I can assure them they don't have any insulation. I've been in countries where I've seen uh, authority break down. They don't know what that looks like. That's a horrible face, and we are not far from that now in this country. We're not far, we're looking at other countries, and attention is being diverted way to other countries, but we're not far away. And it's important for the youth to understand that no matter how distant these people may look who are committing crimes, who are addicted to drugs, who are in the criminal element, no matter how distant they may look today, they're going to find that they're going to get closer and closer, and this is also the world of the rich man is going to get smaller. The more crime that you've got out there, the more drugs that you've got out there, the smaller the world is going to get for people who would like to be productive, who would like to live in peace. So there's no such thing of peace without justice. And the young person now must work for justice and for a new world. And without that, we all are lost.